Okay, hi. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, for this linked art uh, data modeling session. Um, we're glad you're here. This is this is um, our third linked art session during the CDOT conference this year. So we're very glad uh, to have the presentation in this fashion. Tomorrow will be a fourth one, which will be a panel, which we, we invite you to as well. Um, this morning we'll have or today, right now, we're scattered all across the world, so I don't know what hour it is, but um, we will have two uh, members of the Linked Art uh, Working Group model some data uh, coming from the National Museum of Archaeology in Madrid uh, to the Linked Art data model. Um, so we have with us uh, Rob Sanderson, who is the Yale University Cultural Heritage Metadata uh, Project Director as well as Kevin Page. Um, Kevin is Associate Faculty at the University of Oxford at the E Research Center. Um, I want to thank uh, Maria Jose de Almeida also for uh, submitting this fabulous record object from a Roman statue, I think, um, that we're going to be working with today. But before, I want to say that this session is recorded and will be made available online on the CDOC website a little bit later after the conference. Um, uh, if you, we encourage your questions, of course, please use the chat. Uh, you can either answer your question there directly or raise your hands with the feature at the bottom of your screen in Zoom. Um, and I think with that, I'll just say I'm Emmanuel Gass. I'm um, also part of the Linked Out Working Group. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Rob and Kevin. Uh, so I'll, I'll just chip in and say that, that uh, my job today is mostly to collect. If anyone is inspired by these examples that are going on and would like to post a similar example, they might like us to try either today, if we have time, or in one of the later linked out sessions in the new year, uh, please post to the chat and I'll gladly gather them all together into a document for later on. So um, that's mostly what I'll be squirreling away doing in the session. So please, any contributions are welcome. Then if we if we get through the um, the statue, which we, we very may uh, will do, um, then of course we can um, we can do another one in, in this session. Um, yeah. Or you know, if uh, if there's interest in looking at something different because we sort of get bogged down in minute details, then we could swatch as well. So please do feel free to, to throw uh, other examples into the chat, um, and we'll, we'll see uh, how, many, how many we can get through. Uh, I put a link and in the chat um, to the model yeah. documentation, um, which has, is based around use cases uh, rather than an ontology. So um, hopefully, uh, I will try to sort of call out which part we're doing. Uh, but the object description, basic patterns and object descriptions, the first two links in that, uh, um, the, in the, the components of the model, are likely to be where we where we go. But there's also exhibition data for this uh, this object, so that could be really interesting to, to look at as well. And, and before we start, um, could we have Mia Jose introduce herself for a minute and maybe review? I review, give us a, a brief overview of, of the object just to get everybody situated a little bit. It's okay. it's a rich and long description on the website that you, you've sent us. So yes. I'm not sure everybody's read it. So um, maybe giving yes. a, a two minute description would be helpful. Okay. Uh, and uh, the description is in Portuguese. So you have to use Google Translate or something if you don't uh, know Portuguese. I'll, I'll be very brief. This is a statue. I am, well, first of all, I'm Maria José de Almeida. I'm an archaeologist by training. Uh, right now, I'm working on the National Archives, on the um, uh, uh, Information Systems Department. But this uh, is an object that I um, that was found in a, an archaeological site that I was responsible for the, the excavation. And we found those uh, statues. You can see the, an image on the... The Google Doc uh, um, document that was shared, we found those uh, statues 
uh, obviously not in the first deposition context. This is a secondary deposition. And we found one of them, uh, which is a Venus um, from an archaeological site. So it's a Roman villa from the province of Lusitania um, in the Iberian Peninsula, now Portugal. And uh, the statue was headless. Uh, we found them, we found uh, the, a lot of fragments and the Venus had no heads. But later on, we found in the local museum uh, of the Elvers municipality, a head that looked that it could be from our Venus. And uh, we tried it <laughs> to, to, to join the body parts because the, the head was in the local museum with no provenance. They had it registered as unknown provenance. We don't know how we got there. How we got there. Uh, we think probably in the mid 20th century was uh, from um, agricultural works or something. And the head was a bit higher than the, the body, as you can see in the image. So maybe it was uh, thrown up by some um, agriculture um, works. And uh, so we could reunite the, the head with the Venus. And right now the, the head is the, the statue is almost complete in the National Museum of Archaeology in Lisbon. And the museum in Elvis doesn't exist anymore. It was shut down by the municipality and the collections are um, stored. Uh, there's some intention of making a new one, but uh, we didn't know. I think this is a, a, a challenging example because we have here questions of provenance, of um, archaeological uh, dug up material and museum ones, and also the question that fortunately no one has a uh, rose yet of uh, property <laughs> because uh, either the we are the archaeologists are not we don't own the the the, um, the, the statue neither does the museum national Arch uh, national museum in lisbon and the, the the local museum doesn't exist anymore so i'm very keen to uh, see how we can model a complex situation like this uh, thank you for the opportunity Oh, you're very welcome. We'll we'll do our best. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let me um, let me share my screen. But everyone, do you know, pull up the the view uh, of the um, the web page description of the object uh, at the same time, so that we can sort of work along with that. I'm going to use OmniGraph again, um, as we did on on Monday. Um, just because while we have other ways to, to do this, um, this is the probably the prettiest uh, version um, for this particular usage. So um, I think let's start with the sort of tombstone information that we have about it. Um, but also, of course, let's focus on the the bits of the statue, the, the pieces. Um, so we have the whole statue as an as an, an object. So this would be a human-made object, um, and uh, well, we can give it a does it have a name a title just female female figure female uh, statue yeah i think it's uh, in the museum of archaeology it's called just venus venus mm -hmm. so um, here is the name pattern Yes. And then we would give it the primary classification. Um, for folks who 
I'm going to go through reasonably quickly because this is a complicated, interesting object. Um, so I will, I will uh, not repeat all of the minute detail that we did on Monday. Um, and we don't really need language because Venus is just a name. Um, so we might, we, let's just delete this one for, for now. However, I think in, um, at least in the, the Google translated version, um, denominatsono, my Portuguese is terrible, I'm afraid. Um, Estetueta feminina, female, female statue. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. The I, I said Venus, but <laughs> I was uh, thinking about the designation we, the archaeologists gave. <laughs> but yep. in the museum, it's called the denomination, which is the title, is yep. female statue. Yep. Oops, sorry. Let me undo what I just did. Um, so for this, we will need language, of course. So we put the full pattern back in. And this is also, so we've already hit an interesting point, um, which is that who is doing the naming? Where does the name come from? So we can, we can, we can put this in. So part of, part of the sets of patterns, normally for identifiers, but also for names, is that we can say who, who assigned this name to the object via an attribute assignment. So the name was assigned by a particular activity, which is assigning the attribute, which was carried out by um, the archaeologists. Is there, a, is there a formal group or is it just a... Uh, you can say the University of Lisbon because that was a project from the university. Mm -hmm. and then... Portuguese. And we can do this exact same pattern to say that this was assigned by the museum. So we wouldn't we wouldn't do this for every single name. Um, otherwise, every little bit of knowledge would be um, uh, have these attribute assignments of, of who who said it was this tall and who said it was uh, had this material. Um, but for thing for situations when it matters, e.g., the university names it this, but the museum names it that, um, it's a consistent. Uh, a consistent pattern. Um, okay, so then there is the inventory number, which looks very similar. Of course, inventory numbers don't have language, they're just data. But you probably do care about the attribution, um, especially in this case where um, the inventory numbers might change when the ownership and provenance and so on get sorted out, because the inventory number of the head will certainly be different uh, from the, the body. But let's, given that we're talking about the statue as a whole for now, I think the inventory number 2006355.4. Uh, it's classified as an inventory or accession number. Uh, and it was carried out by the museum. Uh, 
then the category uh, is sculpture. So for object type, we can simply attach it directly to the object. And we would use a controlled vocabulary such as, as AAT for managing this, just like all the other types. And then there's the super category of archaeology. Um, would you say that the statue is an archaeology, or perhaps is this more that there is a, a set of objects in the museum that are archaeological? Well, that's an interesting question, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because uh, what what does it what does define an archaeological object? Is the one that was found in an archaeological site? Uh, if so, this is an archaeolo uh, an archaeological object. But then again, the head is not because it was not retrieved from archaeological work. So, if we use this this kind of uh, classification, we could say that the the body is an archaeological object and the head is not, which is rather funny because it's the same object. <laughs> so I, if I had to categorize it, I would just say object. <laughs> then let's get into that partitioning since we seem to be going there pretty necessarily. Um, so the statue, uh, Um, then has two main parts, or two parts that are documented separately um, at various times, and hence we want to maintain that documentation separately. So I think this is one of the things that we've recognized uh, in, in looking at data in linked art, that while you might partition uh, say a chess set into the board and the 32 different pieces. Probably no one needs that level of granularity. Um, that for some, you know, for some, if, if you have all the pieces or if you have an installation with a, a desk and two chairs and an inkwell on the desk and the desk has some drawers probably you don't actually need to separate all of those little bits out, even if you could, unless there's something interesting to say about them, at which point you do need to. So for the chess set, you can imagine the Lewis chess pieces, which are split between the British Museum and um, the National Museum of Scotland. Um, you would necessarily, because they're coming from different institutions, need to separate out those chess pieces compared to a, um, a complete set in a, in a single museum, maybe you don't need to. So here, we do need to. So we might say that uh, the, uh, sorry, which way around was it? The body is archeolo archeological? Yes, the body was found on an excavation and uh, had, we don't know, but it was probably um, some casual finding. Yep. So both both would be sculpture though, or part of part of a sculpture. Just that one would be also um, okay. And of course, we would want to say part. So here's another thing that we've found. Um, interesting in, in linked art, that although we might naturally think of the head is part of, or the body is part of the statue, um, sorry, the, sat the statue has two parts, the body and the head. In fact, uh, when it comes to the interactions with systems, it's easier to go the other way and say the body is part of the statue and the head is part of the statue. Um, because there could be many, many parts 
and if you had if you went from and the there whole, are some there are some still missing we can find them later maybe <laughs> the feet for instance and the hands we don't have them we don't know where they were yep. Yep. and then that, i mean that's another great example so imagine we did know someone finds the hands later or one hand left hand uh, or they, you know, they know where it is, uh, but they, uh, or you know, hopefully someone knows where it is. So then the museum or institution person that has it could link their record of the left hand to the statue, you know, completely independently of the description of the, the statue by the museum and say, this hand is part of that whole statue. And then we get this uh, really interesting uh, ecosystem effect where information can be managed across different systems and without uh, great deals of, of coordination. Uh, okay, so let's jump to the provenance a little bit because I think that's the other really super. So this is sort of the basic um, tombstone information, right? We can also add in the material of marble um which would apply to the whole thing we could add in all of the the text of the page of the page uh as marbly uh as uh, as statements about it um for humans to read and um, we could add in the dimensions um as dimensions maybe we'll do dimensions as well Let me, let me do one of the three dimensions and just to, to demonstrate how it works. So the, the full text of the dimensions is it looks very similar to these names and identifiers, uh, but instead of being a name, it's just a, a, a description a statement. And move these out of the way. But the dimensions, if we can separate them out or as, uh, as structured data. Um, so it's 49 somethings high. So there's a dimension with a value of 49. And it's classified as height. But the text doesn't say what the unit is. Um, is it inches or centimeters? I imagine it's not meters. That would be a huge thing. Uh, it's centimeters. I haven't realized that our National Museum doesn't record for the, the measurement units. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> um, so this is why it's uh, it's always valuable to have people who, who understand the object and its context uh, working with people who understand how to do the, the modeling uh, because it really is always a partnership um, no one person can can have all of the all of the information um okay so dimensions can be modeled like this types uh, the ma materials uh, which are types um can be associated with the object um mm -mm -mm. we know the production so one at least one bit of information about the production which is well, it's... well we we know that uh, we know that we have some parallels of these statues in the, um, in turkey but we we are not sure that it traveled from turkey to portugal uh, to Lusitania, no more specifically mm -hmm. or if there was some kind of tradition um that made local artists made this kind of statues um similar to those in uh, asia minor so we are not very sure uh, about the the fabrication where it took place yep um but there is at least uh third century uh, yeah that's the third date of the roman villa Yep. And you, we assume that the the statue was produced or around the same time, yep. but it could, could be earlier. Yep. 
So we can add. time span and the, the nice thing about CRM and hence linked art is we can be very unspecific <laughs> uh, about um, about dates so it could have been anywhere from 300 AD to the very end of 399 AD no uh, third century 200s sorry Rookie, rookie mistake. Uh, and then the linked art pattern um, for time spans says that you, you might want to not make the consumer figure out that this is third century AD, uh, but instead tell them that information uh, as part of the data, so that when a human looks at the record, they see third century AD, but when a machine is searching for it, they can search between those two text stamps. Um, okay, but then of course it gets lost from history for a, a long time. Um, so we end up in some of the provenance. So um, let me, so let me start another um, another page, uh, just to avoid things getting super cluttered. And we'll talk about provenance of, uh, wh which one should we talk about the provenance of first, the head or the body? Well, I think the, 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 they both, it's, their, their provenance is the same, right? <laughs> Because they are the same object, or am I misinterpreting um, something? Oh well, so um, one they were found uh, at different times. Yes, they were found at different times, but they come from the same place. Yes. Okay. The question uh, is that uh, before we identified the head as part of that body, the head mm -hmm. was registered in the museum has uh, unknown prov provenance. Yeah. It stopped being unknown the day we uh, joined and said, saw that at that fit. <laughs> yep. Yep. All right. So uh, imagine, of course, that this body also has the pointers over to the texture and so forth. So the way that we deal with so production is associated directly with the objects. And we could separately say that the head was produced, but we don't know anything about the production of the head separate from the body. So we don't need to, we don't need to record that. Uh, but then this sort of starts a chain of history uh, of um, the object. And essentially the object first, the, the first thing we know about the object is that it got, um, it got lost. We, we, we no longer, we, we didn't know anything about it for a long time. At some point it was broken up. But then there was, um, a provenance activity that occurred, which was the discovery of it. So this might seem a little bit strange uh, because provenance is normally ownership, uh, which is why the, my default is acquisition. But another sort of Um, interaction with an object is just encountering it, just rediscovering it. Um, and that can happen many times, right? The same object could be found and lost and found and lost and found and lost um, by different by different people uh, or by different uh, different actors. Uh, and some objects can be found even when they're not lost, but they're discovered by some new group. Uh, but were always known where they were uh, by some other group. So we have a notion of an overall provenance activity, part of which is this encounter. And what was encountered? The body. Then 
who did the encountering was the university? Is the, is yeah. the yes, yes, the the, the yes. A project of the University of Lisbon, which was yep. me and another co colleague of mine. Mm -hmm. At which, so, and then that was encountered by. <clears throat> And we know where that took place. I it took expect. place in the in, in a place called Quinta das Longas in Elvas, Portugal. So I won't, I won't, um, just, you, you uh, can just write Portugal yeah. <laughs> or <laughs> Lusitania, maybe it's more yeah. accurate. Um, so then of course, uh, Portugal or indeed the exact location has a lot more information that we can say about it, including all of the names, identifiers, statements, um, geometry and for a geospatial system, um, and so on, as of course does the the actual group that did the made the encounter and um, but let's focus on the um this part for now so at the same time um we don't know if i understand correctly we don't know the ownership because it's not that you in the current jurisdiction took ownership of the body is that true or well uh, the portugal legislation is not very clear about the the ownership of archaeological objects yeah. um so i would say let's consider it like public domain it's not but something like that because it was found during uh, um, an investigation and um because if not, it would be considered that the ownership was the owner of the land. Yep. So that's yep. that's an ongoing debate. <laughs> yep. So, sorry, let me just move this one down here as well. So as part of this overall set of things, first, you know, uh, it was it was discovered it was found but then essentially at the same time you at least took custody of the object so no actual ownership statements we're not talking about legal right of uh, of title or anything like that um, but There was a custody of the object was created, um, in which no one, because no one had custody of it before, but who gained custody, uh, transfer custody to the University of Lisbon and transfer custody of the body and we might we could also might want to say that this transfer of custody took place in portugal um similarly this pattern um of transfer of custody can be used for things like exhibitions so in the exhibitions tab at the bottom of the screen assuming that the object moved to those locations, which I think it, it, it would have. Um, the National Museum of Roman Art in Merida uh, would have had custody of the object transferred to them as part of the exhibition. Uh, and it would have been transferred from the previous custodians being the National Museum of Archaeology. So this 
little graph um, shows essentially that it was seen, the body was seen, uh, and at the same time, custody of it was taken. And we might want to say that this occurred as part of an excavation. Uh, and hence the archaeological assessment. So one imagines that as part of the excavation, there was a lot of other objects also found, um, at which point you would repeat this pattern for all of the other things um, such that you could say, well, which objects were found um, and were discovered during this excavation? Well, it's all of those that had, were um, following these lines. Um, as part of the excavation, there was a provenance activity which, in which it was encountered the object. Okay, so. In, and it simply uh, remained in the custody of the, of the University of Lisbon. Um, but then, then uh, at some point it was transferred to the... Yes, it, uh, it was for an exhibition, a temporary exhibition in Lisbon um, mm -hmm. called, uh, called uh, the Religions of Lusitania. And then we know that with an agreement uh, uh, between the, the owner and the, and the university, it was incorporated in the collections of the National Museum because there was no museum in Elvis. The, uh, the municipality shut it down. Yep. So, so the exhibition first. So instead of being part of an excavation, it was part of an exhibition but you can see now I hope and it wasn't discovered so we don't need this guy but already there's a parallel between two normally quite separate um, types of activity excavations and exhibitions are not you know, on the face of things pretty, you know, not, not very similar. But from a perspective of what is happening, that you know, the, the sorts of information that we're documenting, they actually are quite similar. There is a, a set of objects that are being interacted with, being these ones. And here there's a set of objects that are being interacted with just in a different way. So as part of the exhibition, there was a transfer of custody. And we can make this a little bit tidier. where the custody was uh, custody transferred, sorry. No, transferred custody. Custody from uh, let's go front. And we just get rid of that for now and transfer custody to the museum. So we Quite independent of the exhibition, we know that this happened and this isn't this is interesting. But we also know the provenance, or sorry, the context in which this uh, um, transfer of custody happened. It's in the context of the exhibition. But if all we were looking at was just this one change of uh, of custody, we would probably want to know that at this point. 
The intent was that the transfer of custody is temporary. E.g. it's for the purpose of the exhibition and when the exhibition ended, the intent for this transfer of custody uh, would have been that it uh, would revert back and the university would retake the custody. So in classified by uh, in most exhibitions um, you know, that holds, you don't gain permanent custody of, of objects that are part of the exhibition. Uh, and of course, we should do this because it's the same. But then, copy this again. And of course, we can add uh, time um, into our time spans of when these activities took place, which would, of course, look just like this part. So then there was another transfer of custody right, of the same thing that was then intended as permanent. Did I understand that correctly? So the, the transfer of custody, there was another transfer of custody of, yeah. the, the, of legal yes. custody as opposed yeah. to necessary physical custody. Yes. Yeah. So this is this is also another interesting um, uh, super interesting um, condition that we might also want to say that this is not just permanent, e.g., you know, we've said that this is going to continue, but that it was legal. The note, the sort of what sort of custody are we talking about? Is it sort of the physical stewardship, the physical yeah, responsibility for the object? Yes, well, no, it's, because... a, it's an incorporation on in the collections of the museum, so it's a legal, uh, a legal transfer of custody. Whereas this transfer, we don't need to say that it was both legal and physical because that's sort of the default. You, know, you we, otherwise every transfer. Almost every transfer of custody would have uh, would have uh, both classifications, so we just leave them off for brevity. But of course, when when it's not both, then we do want to be clear. Well, look, it's, we've classified this explicitly as being legal, rather than both legal and physical. So yeah, again, um, this would have been part of some agreement um, between the two parties, uh, and of course. We can collapse our graph because these are really the same entities. And don't make me try to fit this guy. You know, the, this is the same as this. <laughs> you can see from the labels, uh, the, the arrows would become monumentally complex. Um, good, okay. Um, looking at the chat, so we've got 15 minutes left. Um, uh, Alexandra asks, is there any chance to access the mapping in an explorable or usable format? Um, so I'm, I can, uh, I can export these as images um, and, and share them. Uh, that's, I'll, I'll put them into the Google Doc. Uh, we can also, if I very briefly swap my sharing over to the website. In the linked art site, we have a an area, well, let me just show you very briefly what I'm going to talk about. 
we have these examples um, for every single section, there's at least one example. And the way uh, the, the baseline um, is JSON-LD, but of course there's also these links to Turtle or we could add RDFXML if that was interesting and, and so forth. So there's code that generates all of these and from that code it also generates these diagrams, which of course get more and more complicated. So if we went to the provenance section, let's just briefly look at um, discovery, seems we were talking about that. So we discovery an object, we encountered, blah, 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 countering an object. So here we go. This is, this is what we've drawn out as uh, an omnigraphal. Um, um, oh, and it didn't generate the diagram, or maybe it's loading uh, still. Um, so we could um, build, out, build it out using a different technique. Um, which would then generate all of these different uh, um, views and we could do it and you know the intent is uh, that we will have a set of recipes to sort of document um, he, if you have something that is interesting like uh, the psychological multiple um, multiple piece very interesting provenance with the exhibition data you know, how, how did we model this so we'd simply have a a long list of recipes for people to read over uh, and then figure out you know, oh this one is pretty similar to, to my scenario we can just copy that and uh, and reuse it and of course this is a lot of work <laughs> uh, particularly given that the documentation isn't finished uh, yet and so but it's certainly on our community roadmap of something to uh, to engage with really thoroughly um, particularly through these calls um, which are every other week. And, and perhaps I could chip yep. in there and say that we, we have a research project that will have um, some effort coming into it next year to build up some of these examples and particularly those cookbook type examples. Um, so anything that, that you want to sort of contribute now, it, it might be that we're a little sort of ad hoc at the moment as we build up these examples, but we, we're, we're really looking for real world examples that we can build up into those sort of cookbook recipes um to help explain this to other people and and that's certainly something we'd be delighted if others wanted to participate in going into the new year yep. uh, i think we have 10 minutes left um should we continue with the, the situation i don't think it would be um useful to to swap to a different object at this point yeah uh, i think there are yeah. a few suggestions that came in that kevin put in the google doc So, uh, Maria, was, is there anything, what else is there of, of, uh, of interest? <laughs> well, I think this is, um, this covers a part of the, the, model, the, the, the question, because we just modeled the, the encounter of the body, then we would do the same for the head, and then mm -hmm. link the both, both discoveries in contexts uh, to to the um, to the model, so that, I think so that's very interesting, and we can work from here. It's, it's nice. Mm -hmm. Yep, great. So yeah, then of course, yeah, exactly what you said. We would we would do the same sort of thing for the head, and then we know that they're both part of the statue. We can fill out all of the accession numbers and so forth, and using this, these patterns. Um, let me just look at the. Um, oh, one, one thing which is interesting about sculpture uh, is that we had a, a quite a long discussion um, in both Flinked Art and in the CRM SIG um, about visual identity and concluded that um three-dimensional things show visual items just the same way that um that two-dimensional things such as paintings or drawings show visual items so let me just quickly add that in and you'll see why in a minute 
or why I think this is, is interesting. <laughs> Hopefully you do too. So the statue, which is just a physical lump of matter, it was produced and it was produced using a certain technique. It happened at a certain time, but it was produced in such a way that it shows, a, it looks a particular way. And if it didn't look that way, then that alignment of the head and the body would be really hard because you wouldn't have any reason to believe that they were both part of the same original object. And of course, this can, can we can duplicate this onto the head and the body as well. So the reason for this is the Venusness of the object. So we've got we've said in text that it's Venus, but this physical thing shows some image, and there's a relationship between the the look of the object that makes us think it was Venus. So instead of attaching the Venusness to the statue, if we wanted to do it in more um, of a structured yeah, data way, we'd do it. Sorry to interrupt, but we can also yep. add another layer because this. Uh, these sculptures, these Roman sculptures, were copies of uh, models that uh, on the third century that were from sculptures from the first century. So uh -huh. we can even add another layer of this and we have some work done there because when I saw sa said that maybe the production uh, is from Asia Minor, we don't know yet for sure because we couldn't analyze the marble or at least we analyzed the marble but the conclusions were not, not significant. Um, but there are uh, uh, several um, in, uh, uh, sculptures with similar, very similar aspects to this one we found here in the extreme west of the Roman Empire with the ones in the extreme east. So that's another layer to model too. <laughs> and that's the interesting. Yep. Uh, so let not me, just, let not me, only with the Venus, but the, with the other figures as well. Yep. So in order to, uh, I'll short circuit the, the discussion, but um, Venus in CRM terms is not a person um, because gods, Greek gods, we do not think actually existed. So it would be a, a concept, um, but it doesn't matter because the property would be the same, which is represents. So the visual item is a representation, or this is a representation of Venus. And the Venus, uh, we wouldn't, there, there isn't a, well, I don't believe there's a Venus in AAT. We would probably use icon class, which is much better at representing um, mythological concepts. Um, and then if there was another statue, if it was just simply a Venus statue, Venus to Milo, or many, many, many other Venuses, they would all have their own particular look. So it's, you know, it's Milo, it has a, a particular look, we can recognize it, uh, but it also represents Venus. Now, if it was a copy, then it becomes yet more interesting because we don't need to have a separate visual item. Instead, the two statues that show the same, you know, have the same look and feel, that have the same uh, visual experience, can simply show the same visual item. And, you know, in which point, you know, if you attached other information rather than just that it's Venus to how it looks, then you would get access to that from both of these statues. Now, even more interesting, more, 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 more interesting, we can connect the graph better because if we say that the 
this was real this statue was a copy of this statue and hence they show the same content we can say that the production used a specific object and now we're really getting into why the graph structure of CRM is so useful. So this production used the production of this statue used this statue as a baseline. The same would be uh, for photographs. So um, in a slightly different way, the production of a photograph used the negative, but they both show the same visual content. Just one is in negative and one is in positive. So again, it's the same set of patterns and structures that we can apply over and over again um, to make it easier to reason against, to query, to consume, and, and so forth. Uh, and Emmanuel, thank you for the um, icon class for Venus. And, sure. And Rob, it's two minutes before yep. uh, 15. Um, we can go a little bit longer, but um, some people might have to drop off. Yeah. We should, we should try to. I think this is a good place to, um, to stop. We've to stop. Uh, looked at provenance. We've looked briefly at exhibitions. We've looked at an interesting object with multiple parts and uh, interesting production. And we then expanded it out into some of this uh, additional context um, to look at you know, how do we can usefully connect other things so that uh, instead of ending up just at a, a dead end um, when you come to an object page, hey, wouldn't it be lovely if we could instead say, oh, given that you're looking at this statue, you might be interested in this statue because it shows the same visual item, or it might be interested in this other statue over here because it also is a representation of Venus. Or you might be interested in these exhibitions that had other objects in them, or you might be interested in this excavation and the other objects that were found at the same time as this object and so forth. So by building up the graph uh, of, of knowledge, it's not just to reproduce our existing views and catalogs, it's to be able to link everything together and enable the end user, be that a researcher or someone who is uh, you know, just interested in, in the artworks, to explore um, the context and, and, and learn more um, about those things that they're interested in with relative ease by following these, by following these links rather than having to figure out what searches to do at what institutions and with different user interfaces and, uh, and user experiences. So I know a sales pitch. Yeah, that was... <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're doing. That's all right. That's why we're here. <laughs> Thank you so much to Maria Jose for uh, submitting this wonderful example. Uh, oh, uh, I, I thank you. It was very interesting <laughs> to uh, come uh, to discuss this again. Uh, this is a uh, uh, statues was found in the year 2000, 20 years ago, and it still has a lot to say. <laughs> so it was very interesting. And maybe maybe we can keep on uh, with some some examples. Uh, Alexandra asked if, if we could have some the, um, the modeling so we can explore this further. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think we've, we've pasted the link several times in the chat on how to connect with um, off conference meetings for the linked art group. Um, I can, I can do it again, but the, we certainly welcome and thank everybody who submitted example. That, that's wonderful. We'll, um, we'll tackle those outside of the conference. And so please join us. Um, I have just enough time to remind you that tomorrow is the last day of the conference, but don't despair. We have another linked art, uh, session, which will be a panel actually. So that's going to be in channel three <clears throat> at uh, 5.15 for an hour, uh, where we'll give a brief overview of the linked art data model, the community, um, the initiative, et cetera. And then we'll have uh, Mikael Hildebrand, who will present on the Van Gogh uh, Worldwide Project, which is using linked, data, uh, linked art as a data model. And then we'll have um, a panel of 
uh, with uh, five or six different panelists, and we'll tackle questions such as, um, you know, what can LinkedIn do to support the mission of your institution? Uh, what type of data uh, can you work with when you think of LinkedIn? Um, uh, what are the, the tools in the technology stack and, and things like that? So um, this will be tomorrow at 5.15, and we hope to see you, uh, many of you there. Thank you. Thank you to Rob. Thank you, Kevin, Maria, Jose. Thank you very much. Um, anything else I might have forgotten? No, nope. So with that, um, thank you, everybody. See you, see you very soon. Bye-bye now. Thanks. Bye now.